Hello, my name is Michael Lambert, and today I'd like to talk a bit more about Brexit. Um, I, I've been making these videos for, I think, about three months now, since the end of February, and uh, I think this is the 10th video. And to be honest, I've been amazed at the, the response, the number of people who've, who've watched them, and I've been very, very grateful for, 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 for that. And, and also, I've been very grateful for all, all the comments I've received. Almost all the comments, at least 95%, have been positive or sympathetic with what I've, I've been saying. There has been a small minority, really a few hundred out of out of out of nearly ten thousand now, um, who have uh, largely been abusive, um, but have all said, uh, "You lost, get over it." FFS, lots of FFSs, and uh, I just want I want to be clear that I have absolutely no uh, um, intention of getting over it. Um, it's true I lost. I agree I lost. I'm, I don't know why people who think they won are, are, are so so angry. Um, but we all lost. It's not me who lost. Everybody lost. The only people who didn't lose are people who got a lot of money that they can move around. People like Rhys Mogg and so on, who won't be affected anyway. Newspaper proprietors, people who can live abroad or people who can, 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 can make a profit out of the disaster that is happening to, 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 to the UK economy. I mean, we can all see now, you, know, you have to be extremely stupid not to see that uh, Brexit is seriously damaging the the, uh, uh, the UK economy. Uh, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And our reputation worldwide is is, uh, is just going, just disappearing. Um, especially when, as is absolutely obvious, everybody in the world can see we are desperate, desperate for deals. And you only have to look at the Australian deal. I mean, it's just, just absolute desperation. And uh, without deals, of course, Brexit is a complete waste of time. But I wanted to talk today a bit about um, the negotiations and about, particularly about our chief negotiator, uh, Lord uh, Frost, or Lord Gormless, as I, 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 I prefer to call him, um, because he really is clueless. Now, if you think about Brexit, it's... It's one of the biggest trade deals ever done. And it requires extremely skillful dealing, negotiating. We in this country have some of the best business leaders in the world. We've got some wonderful world-class businesses, world-class businessmen, men who understand dealing, have spent their whole lives dealing, and whose careers have depended upon them continuing to deal successfully people who would be skillful in negotiations. But instead, we appointed some civil servant, some former diplomat, Lord Frost. And he really, really doesn't know, he just doesn't know what to do or how to do it. And what I want to do is to just talk to you about a, a committee meeting that took place uh, Monday before last, or no, last Monday, um, an EU uh, scrutiny committee at which he was giving evidence and I want to just quote some of the evidence to give you some idea of how badly we are being served because if you think about it how he gets on with these negotiations determines all our futures we are 67 million people and our children and our grandchildren for generations to come his skill of his negotiations is going to determine how things work out and right now they're going terribly Frost uh, negotiated a deal, didn't he, in December, in a rush, so that uh, Johnson could uh, tell the world that he'd got a deal. And of course, three months later, four months later, he wants to change it, because it didn't work out. What he did, he went off, he bought a car. Now, before he bought the car, he had a good look at it, and he looked at the... Uh, the, the, the handbook and he looked at all this and that and the other. He took it for a test drive, another test drive. He got people to come and have a look. And eventually he decided to buy the car. Paid his money, signed the contract, drove the car away. Four months later, his wife doesn't like it, his children don't like it. He says, I'll go back and change it. I'll get another one. The dealer says, uh, what's sure about that? You know, you bought the car. It's your car. You had plenty of opportunity to, 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 to discuss what you're not happy about with it. He says, well, I don't want to, I, I, I want to change it. And when he senses they're not going to change it, what does he do? He goes around telling everybody that they're being unreasonable and that they're point scoring and that they need to come to their senses. Do you know, when you negotiate, and it doesn't really matter if you're selling some socks to a, 
a guy who's got a stall in the market, or if you're selling to a huge multinational. You have to have good rapport, good relationships whereby you respect each other, you like each other, and you do your best to get on together. The last, last, last thing you do when there's any problem or disagreement or point of contention is to go off and badmouth the other person behind their backs. And this fool, he wrote it all over the Daily Mail. And of course, it's picked up by all the press. Everyone's seen it now. Him saying that the reason that there is a problem with the deal is because uh, 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 the EU are point scoring and being unreasonable. So let me move on to this European Scrutiny Committee. Now, let me tell you a bit about this committee. It's a, a committee which obviously scrutinises how we get on with the EU. Um, I don't know how many of the total members are, but at this hearing last Monday, there were 11 people asking questions. Uh, of them, eight were Tory MPs, and we all know that to become a Tory MP last time, you had to be pro-Brexit. And uh, that meant that you half the potential candidates were eliminated uh, uh, un unless like 60% of the cabinet they were prepared to just change their minds and turn from, 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 from Remainers to Leavers just to be, be, be elected. But anyway, eight of the, the committee were um, Conservatives, a lot of them extremely, extremely uh, um, pro-Brexit, uh, anti-Euro, anti-EU uh, um, um, people. Uh, and then there was uh, Stephen Kinnock, who's a, a Labour MP, who, who voted for, for Brexit and is in favour of Brexit. And then there was a Scottish Independent and a Scottish an, an SNP uh, uh, member. And, and so they all um, had Frost in front of them asking him questions. And I just want to quote some of the things he said in reply to some of the questions. Now, they said to him early on, would you, would you sort of tell us what your, what your job is, what your... You know, what your your uh, brief is. And this is what he said. He said, first, I'm responsible for managing the overall relationship, the implementation of the TCA and the withdrawal agreement, and chairing the Joint Committee and Partnership Council, and so on. Don't know what the so on is. Secondly, I'm responsible for conducting the effective conduct of business with the EU and its member states. So he's responsible for conducting the conduct. Beyond the responsibility of this committee, I also have responsibility for third country trade issues. So you see, he's also he's dealing with the rest of the world as well. He's got so much time. And then he says, I'm trying to find solutions there with the Trade Secretary. Finally, the opportunities of Brexit. That is my portfolio. Then he says later on, in the same sentence, and replies to the same question, he says, then... As I said, the third thing is the opportunities and trying to identify things we can do differently. That is what will make the biggest difference to our economic success going forward. He talks all about going forward, you'll hear that. So within government, identifying opportunities and trying to move them forward. So we've gone through Brexit, we've got all this turmoil at the moment, everything's falling to pieces, and he's trying to identify opportunities. I haven't been identified until now. Then he says, there are huge opportunity for the whole country and the whole government to identify opportunities and move them forward. This is a Brexit negotiator, negotiating for the entire British nation. I'll say it again. A huge opportunity to identify opportunities and move them forward. What sort of garbage is that? A bit later on. The second thing behind that is identifying the next wave of things we want to do. We haven't identified them yet. We've got no idea what we want to do. To identify opportunities. Also, identifying the most promising of those, trying to find ways to make them real, implement them and move forward. Same paragraph. Trying to embed some of that philosophy too is really important. Can you imagine the, the CEO of Tesco talking like this? <laughs> then he says, uh, that is the philosophy that we want to try to take forward more broadly. 
So identifying opportunities, the opportunity to identify opportunities is the philosophy that he wants to try to take forward only more broadly. He doesn't want to do it narrowly. He wants to do it more broadly to, to, to take that philosophy forward. And he says at the end, we are off on a journey that will bring huge benefits. Huh? Yeah, they will to lots and lots of rich people. The whole government are mobilised. We are all fully behind making things happen. The impulsion from bodies such as Ian Duncan Smith's committee will be important to help move things forward. We are just at the beginning, but we are absolutely all committed to making it happen. And then to a later question. One of the advantages that we will get from Brexit is the opportunity to do things differently. That is clear. We need to develop our own ways of doing things and our own philosophy behind it. I don't know if there are any philosophers working on Brexit. I haven't, I haven't heard. Maybe there are. But he's hugely optimistic. Now, Brexit is a complete and utter... I haven't finished with him yet, by the way. Brexit is a complete and utter disaster. Everybody can see it's a disaster. But um, those who are pro-Brexit, or especially all these loony um, right-wing uh, conservative MPs, they're all desperate, desperate to find any shred, any tiny, tiny bit of evidence that Brexit's doing well. There has to be something they can grasp and say, look, 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 we were right, Brexit is good. It's going to be fantastic. Now, the chairman of this uh, um, EU scrutiny committee is Bill Cash, uh, Sir William Cash. He's, um, he's been a Tory MP since uh, Queen Victoria was on the throne. And uh, he's an extremely, uh, uh, extremely uh, pro-Brexit, um, a very, very strong Brexiteer. Now, he... Uh, He's identified some evidence to show just how good Brexit is, how, 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 how you know, there are positive outcomes from Brexit. And I'm going to read exactly what he said, because he interjected during this, uh, this discussion with, with, with uh, Lord Gormless. And this is what he said. And this, this really is almost unbelievable. This is evidence of how good Brexit is. May I mention the example of the cheese industry? I had exchanges with some of them that were very negative when they first, first put their case. When I looked into the statistics, it became apparent that, for example, as far as Egypt is concerned, our cheese exports had gone up by 240%. So there, you know, a lot of people mind about Brexit. Exports of cheese to, to, to Egypt were about 240%. They went up from 1.1 million pounds to 2.7 million pounds. That is a phenomenal, phenomenal, isn't it? Extra 1.6 million in cheese exports to, to Egypt. So there he is. He's looked into the statistics so he could tell the committee that. And the committee are all nodding and saying, yes, yes, yes. This is wonderful news. Wonderful. The figures he was quoting were taken from the beginning of 2020, nine months before Brexit. He is a chairman of the EU Scrutiny Committee, is quoting figures a year before Brexit to say how well Brexit's doing. This is the level of people we're dealing with. These are the people that got us into this Brexit, all these right-wing Tories. And they're all throughout this meeting, throughout this, this interview, with, with, with they're all saying, Thank you so much, Lord Frost, for coming, and it's so nice to hear from you. And oh, it's such a breath of fresh air, and we're so pleased to hear you're doing this and you're doing that. He's talking a lot of rubbish, this man, as you heard. So let's listen to some more things he said. Moving on. We need to develop a new approach, and it is my job, together, obviously, with the Foreign Secretary. That's the Foreign Secretary who didn't realise that um, uh, David Kelly was an important... Uh, link with uh, e uh, the EU, despite the fact that there were 10,000 lorries a, a day crossing. I told the world that. Uh, but the Foreign Secretary has big responsibility here too, to make it happen. Now he says that um, there were a few teething problems with uh, fish and so on, uh, but that's all been sorted out. Apparently, um, trade with Europe is, is now uh, uh, above average for this time of the year. Uh, now consider 
it's virtually impossible to export any food to the EU at the moment, despite the fact that whatever food wants to, the, the Europeans want to send us just, just, just comes in. It's not even looked at. Um, it's impossible to sell food. You can't sell live animals. There's no fish. Um, thousands of firms like mine, for example, I had 300 customers uh, uh, um, built up over 20 years. It ended, uh, absolutely ended uh, um, at, at, at the date of Brexit um, because my customers, none of my customers were prepared to do the, the, the paperwork and I'm just one of thousands of companies. There are companies that are moving their uh, 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 headquarters, their distribution centres across to the EU, sacking people here, employing people in Europe. Despite all that, the overwhelming evidence that trade is is really, really been severely, severely uh, damaged by Brexit. He says it's all sorted out now. They have a teething problems and it's all above average, back to normal. No problem. Because he's doing such a good job. Uh, let's see. Um, and then he starts talking about the EU and how really unreasonable they are and how he's got to whip them into shape, really. He said in the, uh, and this now concerns Northern Ireland, really, which is which is obviously the biggest biggest problem of all. Oh, incidentally, just before I say that, there's, there's another thing. Uh, um, I'll read you this bit here. The UK government is recruiting an external advisor to identify new opportunities. Now, I'm not sure he's going to look for an opportunity to find opportunities to reinforce the philosophy or whether he's just going to go looking for re opportunities. But this is, a, a, you know, some more consultants. Yeah, that's what the government like to do. And they can get lots and lots of consultants, pay them absolute fortunes like this guy. And uh, and then they can say, well, we were just following advice when it all falls apart. So they're looking for new opportunities and uh, um, uh, uh, a task force has been set up, this task force, probably a lot of consultants there as well, to assess how Britain can reshape its economy led by former Conservative Party leader Ian Duncan Smith. Wow. But he's yet to make any suggestions publicly. David Frost said he has high hopes of outside input. So let's have a look at Northern Ireland, shall we? Because that's where everything's such a mess. Well, that's where everything's more of a mess than is everywhere else. He says, uh, there is no evidence that goods not meeting EU standards are getting into the EU single market via Northern Ireland. All this paperwork and checks to deal with a risk that does not exist. You see, what it is he's saying is that the EU making such a fuss. You know, we've told them that if we send goods to Northern Ireland, they, well, they won't go across the border. No one's going to take across the border. People aren't going to smuggle. He says there's no evidence of it. So why are they making this fuss about why all this paperwork they're insisting on? Why? There are 300 crossing points between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Now, supposing somebody drives a van load of goods across four o'clock in the morning through a country lane somewhere. How would he have that evidence? But he hasn't got evidence of that. So therefore, if he hasn't got any evidence, what are the EU making all this fuss for? It's all them being awkward. And then he says, the EU take a very purist view of all this. We did not anticipate this when we agreed the protocol. And it makes no sense. Makes no sense. We've signed a protocol, agreed it all. They want us to abide by it. Makes no sense. We don't want to. There's no evidence of any smuggling. I mean, who in a in, in a country like Northern Ireland or a province like Northern Ireland, who would ever think there'd be any criminals or people who might want to actually smuggle stuff across into the EU or back from the EU into the UK? Who's going to do that? Unimaginable. Then he says it's kind of, you know, he hopes they'll come to their senses. I hope that they will uh, see that there is an interest in constructive and collaborative relationships with us. I would expect that to happen. We're trying to influence, influence our biggest neighbour, and that requires sustained effort and expertise. He's the expert, which we intend to give it. 
And then he gives us a bit of diplomatic advice. He's a former diplomat. Never had any involvement in business apart from being a chairman of some whiskey federation or something. This is how he advises about uh, diplomacy and negotiation. You have got to be persuasive and you've got to present things in a win-win ways. That is the basic technique of diplomacy. Win-win ways. Genuinely, this is a joint uh, operation and I'm sure we will come out in a good place. Well, let's all hope so, shall we? And about the EU, he goes on again. It is a characteristic of the EU's approach to things. They very often tend to take quite a legalistic, purest way of doing things. You see, they're so unreasonable, these EU people. This is the problem. They sign an agreement and they expect you to stick by it. I mean, it's just ridiculous being so purist and legalistic. Absolutely absurd. I mean, no wonder he's got a job to do the deal. I do not think it is unusual. We're not the only people to experience that. See, they do it to other people as well. Whenever they sign deals, they expect people to abide by them. It's so frustrating. That's what he says, actually. I think it's a common for third countries dealing with the EU to experience that. When the EU legislator, as they say, has decided things, there's no further discussion to be had. That is obviously frustrating. It must be very frustrating for sign a deal if they want to stick to it. Then he says he hopes that when the fresh, French restaurants start finding they're running out of fish, he thinks they'll come to their senses. And that's that's more or less it, except he does um, end up by saying it's it, it's hard to see that the, the way the protocol is currently operating, the way that he negotiated and, 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 and uh, signed for, or got Boris Johnson to sign for, can be sustainable for, for long. So, as you can see, this man is clueless, and yet we're all in his hands. The whole nation is his hands. In the meantime, we're becoming a laughing stock. Uh, we've lost all respect. We've gone from being uh, laughed at to being pitied to be really rather disliked now. Um, it's not too trivial to mention the results of the voting in the Eurovision yesterday. Uh, I mean, you know, just people, people have had enough of us, and uh, there is no way that this Frost fellow is going to uh, uh, um, come with 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 with, 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 a, with a better deal. Uh, it is not possible. There has to be a border between the UK and and Ireland, and that's something he 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 does not. Uh, sorry, the uh, UK and and uh, and the EU, and he doesn't seem to 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 understand that. And uh, heaven help us all, whilst he's in charge. But things are falling apart so quickly at the moment, and things are moving so quickly that you know who knows what's going to happen. But anyway, that's my, my, that's my uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, and, um, and if you've watched this far, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, bye-bye.